Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Responsible Tourism, How to Be More Green When You Travel, and, or other places as well, but particularly travel. Um, I wanted to, uh, I'm Jody Schneider, I'm the president of the FCC, and I wanted to, um, before introducing our panel, our esteemed panel, wanted to make a few uh, comments about some upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, I think it's pretty much sold out, but if you are interested, check downstairs afterwards. We're having a panel uh, with Regina Ip, Tara Joseph, Charles Mock, and um, moderated by myself on foreign interference in Hong Kong affairs or welcome support for democracy, a panel discussion on the U.S. Congress's Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. And then next Tuesday, or I'm sorry, Tuesday, uh, the 5th of November, we're having uh, Willie Wolop Lam in to talk about Beyond the Trade War, the Fight for China's Future. And I know some of you here today are guests, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in uh, the FCC and our events like today's, to consider joining. You can fill out an application. We have them downstairs. And uh, I and other correspondents, like our moderator Chris here, could be your correspondent signatures if you need them. So please consider joining us. Uh, I wanted to uh, now introduce our panel. Uh, the topic, Responsible Tourism, How to Be More Green When You Travel. We've been watching some of the videos while we eat. Uh, and, fo and the focus today is on how you can enjoy travel while minimizing your impact on the environment, communities, and wildlife, and what sustainable or responsible tourism means, and what eco-friendly choices are available when you go on a business trip or a holiday. Our panelists today are Jan Lada, who's an author, wildlife photographer, and publisher of 17 True to Life books, uh, educating children about endangered animals. To create these books, she's traveled a number of places, including China, Sri Lanka, Borneo, India, Uganda, Costa Rica, and she's been to 11 times to Africa to photograph animals in the wild. Vincy Ho is our next panelist. She's the lead Hong Kong coordinator for Impact Travel Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that educates travelers on how they can help protect the environment. She's also the co-founder of Mini Acts for the Greater Good, a Hong Kong educational organization, and owns Paths Crossing, which is a social enterprise focused on ethical and sustainable travel habits. And Sonali Figurias is the founder and editor-in-chief of Green Queen, an award-winning media platform that advocates for social and environmental change in Hong Kong and that aims to shift consumer behavior. And the panel will be moderated by my colleague, actually my colleague twice over, Chris and I are on the board up here together and she also is at Bloomberg with me, uh, Christine Servano. So thank you very much and enjoy the panel. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming here today. Um, so before we begin, just a, a note that uh, Jen Lata, our esteemed wildlife photographer, um, panelist books are at the back. You can see them over there if you'd like to peruse and buy them. She's also going to sign them after the panel. So um, to kick things off, uh, we're discussing one aspect of how all of us can be more environmentally friendly, and this aspect is through traveling, which I'm sure all of you enjoy. Um, so first question for our panelists, um, how do you define sustainable tourism? Maybe let's start with Dr. Ho. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's okay. So um, the conventional definition of tourism, usually it's very tourist centric, right? So um, we, we focus on the tourist, you know, going places for fun, for leisure, for personal enrichment. But um, sustainable travel emphasizes the mutually beneficial experience for the travelers and also for the local people. And uh, sustain, to me, sustainable travel can be defined as what um, we as travelers and the travel industry can do together to maximize the benefits and to minimize the negative impact on not just the environment, which is very important, but like the community, the local economy, the working animals, wildlife, and you know, the ecosystem um, as a whole. Dr. Sonali, would you like to follow? I think the key word, the key word there is, is would be impact. 
So just as a baseline, I would want to ensure as a sustainable traveler that my travel isn't having any kind of negative impact, maybe a neutral impact, but ideally go towards a positive impact. So how can we create good as a traveler? Because I do believe that the, the discussion around sustainable tra tourism is important, but it's also important to remember that travel is important. Without travel, we don't learn, we don't discover, we don't, we don't explore, we don't connect with people that are foreign to us, and, and cha sometimes travel can be life-changing. So we, and, and the other thing that's worth mentioning is that, you know, it is important to say that we have never traveled more than we do today. So I think the discussion for sustainable tourism is, is incredibly relevant because especially here in Asia, um, the amount of travel that is happening and that is going to continue to happen is, is, is quite, is, is quite it, 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 it's huge. It's more than all the travel that is currently happening today. So by 2030, Asians are going to be traveling nonstop. And so if that keeps going, there actually won't, be, we won't have tourism if we don't have sustainable tourism. And I think we also have to remember, uh, let's say when we're going to Africa, um, I asked Dr. Tammy Matson, um, who does very special tours, uh, and she said, um, the benefits have to flow back to the local people who bear the brunt of living with wildlife that destroy their crops uh, and kill their people. Um, She said that uh, more for the privilege of being in a wild environment and having less tours, so causing less human impact, cheap mass tourism can be very damaging. Um, I was part of a film crew in South Africa and they were doing a wonderful experiment when um, they got the villagers to do a crop of chili. Um, the elephants were destroying their crops, so the chili crop was chopped up with their dung and they burnt it at night and the elephants didn't like the smell so they didn't destroy the crops. So it was wonderful when we can work together um, with animals and people to live together. So I think we touched on some very important points there that sustainability has to affect not just the communities, the animals, but the environment, so all three in conjunction. Um, could you just tell us, because you all have interesting stories, Sonali, you're based in Hong Kong, um, Jan Lata, you flew in from Australia, and Dr. Vinci Ho is with us today uh, from New York by way of France. So you all have very diverse um, fields and industries, but could you tell us the personal journey that led you to think more about eco-friendly tourism? Maybe let's start with you, Jan. Uh, my journey began when I came face to face with a mountain gorilla in Rwanda 25 years ago. Uh, I just found very sad that there are only 600 mountain gorillas left in the world. So when I came down the mountain, um, I decided I would make books for children on endangered animals. I wasn't sure, so sure how to go about that, but uh, I thought that the young generation was the generation that was going to save the endangered animals in the future. So I went from a highly paid a creative director in advertising uh, to a rather poor but very happy publisher. Um, I just felt it was important to make books that weren't cartoons or illustrations, that were a genuine, true-to-life book of the animals. So I learned to be a wildlife photographer, and I went back to uh, photograph animals in the wild to tell their story. I wanted to be their voice. So that made me very aware of um, Africa, the environment, and I've been back to Africa 11 times um, and all the other countries you mentioned earlier. And it was so wonderful in March this year when I was doing my latest book to see a sign saying cotton buds are not allowed. Would you like to? Yeah. Um, I, for me, my whole life is about sustainability, so it's not specifically to do with travel, although that is one of the important aspects. One of the biggest things I try to do is actually travel less, or at least travel less on planes. Um, I'm sorry to, to be the bearer of bad news, but there are two things as an individual that you can do to, 
to, to basically be more sustainable and that's to eat less meat and to fly less on planes. So that's part of my journey. But originally I, um, I had a lot of chronic health issues when I was younger that weren't getting solved by regular allopathic medicine. And uh, that led me to uh, explore the connection between what I was eating and health. And the more I went down that rabbit hole, the more I realized that uh, not only was it about the foods I was eating, but how those foods were grown um, that had an impact on me and my health. And that sort of led me to opening the door to changing how I lived because I found out more about agriculture and our broken food systems and it's all related. And I think that's what led me to Green Queen because you can't really have a healthy planet without having a healthy humanity and vice versa. So we really, I, I realized that there might be other people out there like me that wanted to live a healthier, greener life. And I had accumulated all these resources on how to do that. So what kind of products I was using, what I was eating, where I was eating, local farms that I was working with, um, companies I was supporting by voting with my dollar for, for um, brands that were more ethical, more sustainable. And I decided to share it online. And right away there was just a, a big return in terms of people coming to the site and really connecting with that. And a couple years after that, we decided to make it a more fully fledged media platform so we could cover news, stories, articles, guides, and that's how we grew into where we are today. So we don't just cover sustainable travel, but we cover how, how to eat sustainably, how to, how to live sustainably, how to work sustainably, everything to do with health, sustainability. We call it eco-wellness. Um, that's how it led me to today. Okay. Um, so I'd like to echo what Sonali just said, um, how to live sustainably in, includes flying less, which <laughs> I did the contrary to be here, unfortunately, but I do offset my carbon footprint. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> and uh, to eat less meat and to maybe have less children as well, right? Um, but anyway, like back to um, my journey towards being becoming a sustainable traveler. Um, actually, I would say it's it's thanks to a lot of mistakes that a lot of people make that I also made before, like riding elephants, like um, going on volunteers, volunteerism trips, you know, working in an orphanage while realizing at the end of a month that I actually didn't do anything for them. So it's all these experiences that like um, contribute to my awareness of what, um, like, of all, all the kind, like all kinds of impact that a travel traveler can make, and I remember one time um, I told you this story before. Like one time I was staying in an international um, hotel chain resort with four swimming pools and a huge golf course. And you know, back in the day, I I was just an ordinary tourist, and I was only thinking about my vacation. But then I realized that people actually in the community um, didn't have like. Um, uh, enough drinking water. So while drinking water was scarce in the community, and then we have like four swimming pools where we cannot, in any case, be at, in all of them in one at one time. Um, what's the point of like going for that option? So um, and also there was a lot of reflection that I made about my choice of hotels and you know other things as well. And in this particular case, I. Um, that land that was used to build this huge hotel resort um, was made possible by displace, displacing an entire village. And so like by just looking at um, the kind of choices that we make for our trips, um, we need to learn to be more aware of like all the impact on the local community, on the economy, on the food waste, like the amount of food waste from all these hotel buffets, for example, um, you know, at the end of every day. So like it's, there is a lot that we need to think about. And, um, and I came to uh, create it create this game called Pass Crossing and in there it basically covers like all the um, all the issues uh, that you know that we we talk about that we need to consider within the the realm of sustainable travel in terms of our impact as travelers on the people on the culture 
um, on the local economy, wildlife, working animals, and the environment? Well, I think not everyone would immediately quit flying. So we mentioned that flying less would be one of the ways to really be sustainable. But short of doing that, um, what are your basically what are the top tips for you for those who are new to this and you know no one wants to quit flying sometimes you really have to um, especially in Hong Kong it's a very international city um, what are the ways that you would advise say people who are coming at this with new eyes like what would your top tips be for traveling sustainably maybe we could start with you sure um, I do understand that like uh, we do need to fly, you know, because you know we have obligations for work and and, and for family so and so on. And as um, and sometimes it's unavoidable. But if you can um, travel less in business class, and if you have to, if you're offered to do that, um, maybe consider offsetting your carbon footprint would be a good thing to do. Because uh, um, hang on, why? Put it down somewhere. So, uh, like, in, when we talk about our carbon footprint when taking flights, we actually talk about like the uh, the space that we occupy as an individual. So, if you are carrying more things, if you have a heavier suitcase, or if you are like flying first class or business class, then you're basically like you would basically like incur more carbon footprint than. Um, than traveling in economy class, so you know one of, and also um, it's good. It's always better to fly direct than to make stops because every time an aircraft take off, it consumes an enormous amount of fuel, and that is when we produce the most carbon emissions. So if there's a way to fly direct, or if you have the means to fly direct instead of like making stopovers, do definitely do that. And also, um, if you have older, independent children, you know, like let them sit in the economy because, like, trust me, they'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think so. I think you have to divide it into it, it's a big subject. So if you're planning a, a trip, how do you kind of conceive of, of doing it the greener way? Yeah. So I think first you have to start, take a step back and, and talk about the travel, which I feel that you covered really well. So fly light, fly direct, uh, fly economy, and fly less, obviously. Um, the number one thing you can that everyone can do is to offset their, their, their travel footprint. There are many um, there are many resources out there to do this. There's a great one called Choose Dot Today, where you can actually sign up to uh, different monthly plans to offset your travel and your life. And there are different budgets depending on, and they they help you offset two or three trips a year, or or four or five or what what have you. So that's that's an easy one if you want to just start by not inconveniencing yourself too much. At least you're putting some positive impact back onto the planet. Um, after that, it comes to what operators are you going to choose to work with, and that goes to airlines, transportation, um, tour operators if that's where you're going, hotels. I mean, we are living in a capitalist system, so the biggest impact you can have is right now with voting with your wallet. And it, I won't, I won't lie. And I think this is one of the later questions, but it is still quite difficult to find these sustainable options. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have great resources, so it'd be great to get your website. But other, for the rest, for mass people, it's difficult. But there are changes coming. For example, Sky Scanner um, now shows you on your results when you're looking for flights which are the ones that have a smaller carbon footprint. So you can actually choose your itinerary based on that. That's already something. Other things like Airbnb just announced that they are working with WAP, a wildlife protection uh, NGO, to only recommend animal experiences that are cruelty free. Um, there are obviously, of course, there's no, um, there's no better way to support a local community than to choose smaller, independent, non-mass tour operators and activities. So there are ways you can get to that in the sense of planning, there is a lot you can do. And then when you're actually traveling, it's really important to, to be light. because And why is that? Because the heavier the load on the plane, the more fuel it uses, so the more footprint. Um, also, um, 
try and go plastic free when you're traveling. Bring a kit of reusables. It's not so difficult. Try and avoid anything packaged and bottled water where possible. Maybe travel with tablets that can um, clean any filtered water so, or any water so that you can have water on the go with your own reusable travel bottle. So these are kind of our easy tips that you can have day to day that you can also apply in your daily life. Um, also, eat more vegetarian food when you're traveling. You know, maybe pick the vegetarian meal on the plane, maybe choose vegetarian, a couple, do your Green Monday while you're traveling too, you know. These are ways to have less of an impact um, just in general. Also, try and choose local when it comes to food. So try and support F&B. Don't go to Thailand and eat, um, you know, Angus steak. You know, uh, you laugh, but I see people doing that every time I travel. It's completely unnecessary. Um, forget the beef part, but just importing it when Thailand has maybe one of the best food cultures in the world, you know? So is there a way to kind of use this opportunity as a way to really get involved with like, the local culture and tradition and support local smaller operators, independent families, um, maybe stay at B&Bs instead of large hotels, or support hotel chains that are committing to sustainability? You know, um, Marriott, Intercontinental, these are big chains that have announced plans to get rid of single-use plastics in their amenities. It's not perfect, but it's good. The Six Senses um, resort chain has a huge sustainability plan that they're holding themselves accountable to with various different factors. So there are hotels that are trying to, to change, and I think it's because they see the writing on the wall. The hotels that don't will really suffer eventually. Okay. And hotels now, um they don't change your towels every day, they don't change uh, your bed linen, you have a choice. But um, at home, I do my washing once a week, so there's no reason for someone to change my bed every day uh, or my towels. I think that goes to the, to the topic of luxury. I think we need to redefine, because a lot of us when we travel, right, there's a part of it that we're trying to pamper ourselves. So can we pamper ourselves in a, in a way that isn't hurting the environment Absolutely. or the local community? So I think it's just redefining luxury yeah. in that way. Um, well, I normally live in a tent, so I <laughs> don't have luxury at all. But I just wanted to mention um, the Asilo Group in Africa, uh, and I go to their camps all the time. They won the uh, 2017 International Year of Sustainable Tourism. Uh, their camps are, are wonderful. They give back to the community. Um, there's even a camp uh, that women run, which is unheard of in Africa, and um, a very special um, group, a silly group. Did you say it's run by women? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Um, just to, so I guess, with, to pipe in with some data. So the UNWTO um, estimates that 1.18 billion people will be flying by 2030, and that they estimate that the tourism industry contributes about 5% to global carbon emissions. 75% um, of that 5% uh, is from through transport. So I'd like to ask you, you mentioned offsetting your carbon. How does that actually happen? Uh, and what are the, you mentioned some resources that people can use, but what does that involve? That's a great question because obviously offsetting your carbon is a, is it can be, you know, an opaque science. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's about finding reputable organizations that work with projects. So basically the, the whole point of offsetting your carbon is that, so you're traveling, so you're creating emissions, so you're trying to, uh, neutralize that by choosing projects that add carbon. So it tends to be a lot of forestation, mm -hmm. uh, reforestation programs and adding trees to the, to, to the planet because obviously that, create, that, that reduces carbon emissions. So the most important thing there is to really make sure you're choosing carbon offsetting partners that are kind of audited by third parties and that have a record and that again hold themselves to transparent standards and have data to show what they're doing and you can actually see where your your funds are going and what projects they're working on um, or you can go directly to tree planting organizations which I'm happy to share a few um, with you after okay um, I actually have a slide to uh, show Please move to the um, sustainability sustainable travel manifesto. Uh, no, uh, can you just scroll down? Uh, sorry, one slide up. Yes, yes. So um, 
this is uh, uh, one of my favorite travel blogs, and I know the the blogger, the writer herself, in who's. Um, who's based in New York City, and she wrote a very uh, succinct um, sustainable travel manifesto. Uh, can you do my clicking on it, please? Uh, like the link? Yeah. Thank you. you Sorry. Have to be in the, um... I think we have to be online, but maybe we can't click on it at this okay. moment. Okay, well, uh, Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, so basically, uh, like about tips for traveling sustainably, there there is a huge list. But um, what we want um, you know travelers to know is that it's not not only like concerns for the environment itself, which is very important, but also like how to let go of our pre-existing notions of what a culture is you know and and travel really travel mindfully and and to cultivate a mindset of constant learning through travel so um that manifesto has a very um a very good framework of understanding what sustainable uh, sustainability in travel really means and it it is divided into five domains like uh yes this is it um, so the first domain is a uh, material domain, like how we can um, uh, use the resources at the uh, uh, tourism destination mindfully so that you don't use up or like exploit the available resources at the uh, travel destination. And then, um, sorry, do you mind? Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm not sure if they can read actually. Yeah, okay, so it's just like, the, yeah, the five domains. Um, the spiritual domain, um, uh, understanding, recognizing that travel is a privilege, and uh, and that we have the responsibility to uh, not to reinforce stereotypes when we come back from trips, you know, things like that. So it it is a very well organized, very well structured uh, uh, framework of sustainability uh, in tourism. So I I really highly recommend this, uh, that you would go through this manifesto? Um, it seems like it does take a lot of research and extra effort to become a sustainable traveler and a lot of sacrifice. Um, could you just uh, let us know what your thoughts are on, say, spotting a fake? Like, some people can just slap on eco-friendly on their Green websites or... Yeah, so could you talk a little bit about how do you know that this travel company or this hotel is genuine in their advocacy? Um, shameless plug, read Green Queen. Obviously, we do our, we really pride ourselves on our research and we double check everything that we publish and we're very strict and we don't publish a lot of stuff that I think other lifestyle um, media would publish because most people are now jumping on to the sustainability trend. So it is getting more crowded out there for people like yourselves to find information. And to be very frank, there aren't that many regulatory kind of backed organizations where I can say to you, okay, if you go to this website, you know, you can find everything. There are some resources which I would be happy to share, but the truth is, Christine, is that it does require a little bit more research than your average trip. Um, the best thing I could say is there are some fantastic kind of uh, tour operators or travel agents that do try to be more mindful and conscious and those are worth trusting because they do the the homework but I can't point you to a certification right now that is you know really trusted and reputable that would cover everything uh, there are different certifications for different things so the animal realm is one thing the cultural local community realm is another F&B is another hotels are another um, I, I'm afraid I can't give a an easy answer on this one. I mean, would you agree, Vincy? Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. Um, it, it is very difficult because there are so many, like, um, you know, travel companies uh, in the industry around the world. There is uh, one organization that is called Global Sustainable Tourism Council, GSCT, uh, sorry, GSTC, and they do certifications and accreditations um, uh, for travel, like government organizations, uh, like tourism board, and you know, and also like tourism companies, airlines, hotels, tour operators, and they do give out like uh, accreditation if those 
uh, companies meet those uh, sustainable um, sustainability standards, and they set their bar quite high. So, um, and, and that actually, and their criteria actually cover um, all aspects, like all elements in sustainable travel, um, in environment, in terms of community, in terms of uh, wildlife preservation, and so on. So, yeah, um, I have that uh, in the slide. That's called GSTC. And they are they are pretty good, um, and very uh, global sustainable tourism council. They are like one of the leading um, sustainable travel accreditation body in the world. Uh, well, otherwise, like those are all the resources that you can because uh, Impact Travel Alliance, um, you know, like that uh, that I am a associated with and they do give out a lot of resources um, on you know uh, tourism businesses that are like truly sustainable but in general just when you're not sure about whether a business is really sustainable or not try to go to their website you know just by claiming themselves to be eco-friendly is not sufficient Go to see if they have like any published policies like specifically explaining like what, like what sustainability policies they have and how they do it and what are the results and impacts that they have been making. So that if they are genuinely like serious about it, they will tell you on their website. Another thing is proxies. Okay. Because, for example, if you were looking at an itinerary and they were suggesting to go and ride elephants, maybe that's a that's a tip. Okay, maybe these, this is not really environmentally and socially. That's a red light. Exactly. So there are some red lights to look out for. Or if you go on a Facebook page of a you know of a, a of a tour or an activity and you see kind of single use plastics all over the photos and things like that, maybe then they're not taking things seriously. Or if you see tour um, operators where there's a lot of travel with which require which you could do by bus or by train but it's all done by plane mm -hmm. and and very kind of small amounts maybe that's those are the ways to kind of think of how to how to kind of gauge if there's a feel for environmental and social concerns Absolutely. right if they talk about NGOs they're partnering with right that's always a good sign you know if they say things like oh we don't we don't promote any kind of cruelty for animal activities i mean maybe that's not perfect but it's a start those are ways to kind of get an idea that at least people are thinking about these things you know Miss Lata, you had actually a very different um, approach to this. She is the adoptive mother to several animals. Could you talk a little bit about how, how that helps? Yes, the well, uh, when I went to Nairobi about eight years ago, I discovered the Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage. And I went down the list of orphan names, and there was an elephant called Yatta, Y-A-T-T-A. And as my surname is L-A-T-T-A, I decided to adopt uh, this tiny baby elephant. Now she is living in uh, the wild with a wild herd, and she has two babies of her own. But over the years, I've adopted uh, eight elephants. Uh, my latest little one is called Migu, who was speared by villagers uh, that killed her mother. And the little baby almost died of her injuries. But I fell in love with her and um, adopted her. And I've written about her in my uh, Adventures in the Wild uh, because she became a little mini matriarch of all the new baby orphans that came in. But every school I talk to, and on this trip I've got 52 presentations, uh, I encourage the school to adopt an elephant. Um, it's a wonderful project for children to be involved with and they get a weekly, a monthly report about how their baby is doing and uh, it's really a very rewarding uh, experience. To add on to um, the, um, the subject we spoke about earlier, um, I always follow uh, the camps, um, uh, especially Asila. Um, it's uh, it's very sustainable, and they're very aware of um, uh, protecting the environment and, and helping the locals. But often I'm asked by businessmen who are organizing a seminar, and they're taking their wives to Africa, and I guide them in the right direction. And I don't mean to feel 
<laughs> flippant as I say this, but they all say, you know, what should our wives bring? And I do a very, very limited wardrobe for them. And I say, um, but they must take great underwear because everyone's going to see it hung up on a branch on a tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, it seems as if uh, so all this responsibility is on us, the traveler, to make sure that we are being eco-friendly, eco-conscious about all these aspects. But how about the industry? What are the changes that you see in airlines and travel companies in being becoming more green? Are there actually a lot of options or we're still a bit limited in terms of eco-friendly tourism? Yeah, so there is a growing number of uh, uh, tourism industry, uh, like, tourism businesses that um, that like uh, work towards a more sustainable model um, like high fly uh, uh, an airline a Portuguese airline which is the first airlines that offer an entirely f plastic free flights because like the number of the number of plastic cups that we throw away every day just you know uh, by the airline air industry is like horrendous so this is one of the examples of like what the industry instead of like us individuals can do to help the environment um, there is a, a social good business called off-season travel like off-season adventures and it is a great example of social good travel business because they run tours to Africa during the off-peak season and they encourage that because they they want to tackle over tourism and to contribute to the local economy when things are a little calmer and and also what they do is to empower the local communities through social social projects um, in long term um, these are so these are the examples of companies that um, uh, work towards a, a, you know higher sustainable goal but in terms of countries for example I'm not sure if you know Palau uh, Palau is the first country uh, where they um, obliges or they yeah where tourists or visitors are obligated to make an eco pledge. That is written by the children of Palau to protect their gov to protect their environment and the um, and their wildlife. So that is beautiful. Absolutely check it out. Um, and to look at how the stamp looks like on the passport and definitely get one if you, you know, if you ever travel to Palau. Anything you'd like to add, Sonali? Um, I think um, in, a in certain parts of the world, there is some regulation here in Asia. We're still kind of a little bit behind. And I think that it's harder to get companies to act um, if there's no regulation, unless consumers vote with their dollars, which is what's happening. So I think you do see airlines and uh, hotels really, as, as I spoke about Intercontinental, Marriott, um, for example, Cathay Pacific just debuted uh, Omni Pork on their business class menu, which is a, a, meat, re a meat a replacement for pork. Um, there are things happening. There's more and more vegan and vegetarian menus online. So that is all coming from consumers asking for um, options. Um, the fact that Skyscanner is showing you the carbon footprint, these are, these are showing you that there is a change generally. Um, people do want to do the, good, the right thing. Um, exactly how that's monitored and how many people are doing it is, is harder to kind of give data on. But I don't, without actual regulation, which I'm not sure is imminently ar arriving here in Asia, I think we, we as consumers really do have to keep pushing companies. And uh, especially corporates, I think that one of the biggest ways we can affect change is corporates are account for a huge amount of revenue for hotels and air airlines. So if corporates take pledges to only work with airlines and hotels that are responsible, this is where the big change happens because that's where the big dollars are. So, you know, I, I, I would say if you work for a big comp company, mm -hmm. challenge them on their travel Absolutely. policy does your company have a responsible travel policy and are they working with responsible operators and are they pushing their partners to, to do better? Um, I guess to wrap up before we open the floor to questions, a last question for you all. Um, could you just give an example, a very 
like a, a memorable example of a country or a trip that you took that you thought embodies what we're trying to talk about today, which is sustainability and tourism. Um, would you like to start? Um, one thing that I can quickly think of is like there are a lot of, uh, you know, UNESCO or archaeological sites that give out a limited amount of permits every day to limit the number of visitors. Uh, for example, Machu Picchu, uh, you know, and certain, I think like some islands were even closed down in Thailand or in the Philippines at some point because there were just too many tourists. Yeah. So that is like, that is the kind of initiative that a country would take, you know, to, to try and combat uh, over tourism. And you? Um, a memorable uh, time. I was um, I was at a camp which is a conservancy, um, so it's a wonderful camp, uh, very selected um, camps, uh, deep stoned, um, gather around you know one poor animal. I always travel alone, uh, and I was in a camp by myself, and I was having dinner with the camp manager. Uh, we were in the mess tent, which is a big long tent with a space in the middle. As we were eating, there was this great banging and crashing, and a big lion was chasing a wildebeest right through the middle of our tent. That was definitely a first for me. Um, the Maasai came running down, and uh, I think my heart started working at some point, and um, they know the behavior of lions, so I felt okay whilst they were there. When we all calmed down and the lion made his kill, I said, uh, how am I going to get back to my tent? And Roloff, the manager, said, oh, don't worry, the Maasai will walk with you. So I had two very large Africans on either side of me. I was trying to be as invisible as possible. And we walked towards my tent. It was very dark. They were swinging their torches around, um, picking up part of the pride of lines on the left. And one line was just beyond my tent with its eyes glowing in the torchlight. I grabbed hold of one of the Africans and I said, we can't keep walking, look. And he said in his wonderful, wise way, it is okay, Jan, you are closer to the tent than the lion is. <laughs> the desire to run was quite intense, but they got me in safely. And uh, my tent was really in the road. I mean, the lions used to walk through there every night. My tent had just been put up for me before I arrived. But um, that's quite memorable. I hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> How about you, Sunderland? Um, mine is a little more, more kind of run of the mill, but I uh, I went to um, a, a sort of a detox kind of wellness resort in the Philippines called The Farm. Maybe some of you know it. And I was actually deeply inspired by the way that they run, they operate their resort. So they are based on a coconut plantation. Um, I don't know if many of you know, fun fact, that coconut palm trees are from the Philippines apparently um, historically so it's um, they're, they're quite beautiful and they um, what they did is they created an artisan workshop to make coconut oil and coconut soaps and basically they use every part of the coconut to operate their resort they use the excess oil as um, cooking oil they have the oil that they use the the virgin oil they use to create body scrubs and products in the room so there's no plastic no single-use amenities they've been doing this for almost 10 years they also work to employ everyone in the local community so all the staff is is hundred percent local and there's many programs for the staff to um, get trained and upskilled to advance so a lot of the managers are also local which I think is wonderful because a lot of times you'll go to big resorts and they bring in managers from outside so instead they're empowering the local community it's very very strong on women um, they only serve vegetarian and actually it's, I think completely vegan the cuisine there so absolutely very low carbon impact um, everything in the resort is meant to connect you to the local environment but also the tradition so some of the relaxation exercises will involve um, doing a meditative Filipino uh, exercise where you, or, or tradition where you, you use fallen uh, flower leaves and create patterns on water. So it's I felt very connected locally to the culture and the community and I felt that everyone who worked there was very empowered and it was completely zero waste at a time when the term had not even taken off. So 
I just felt it was a really special, I, it really stayed with me and, and we went back because of that. Okay. Can I do that? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I don't really have like one single like memorable um, experience uh, from my travels, but I would say uh, I do manage to keep in touch with most people that I meet on the road especially the locals and I, I would also invite you to do the same because like that's that's transformative not just for the local people but also for yourself and uh, friendship that you like the kind of connection that you make with human beings who are different from you but who are actually like pretty similar to you as well all, all over the world it's it's a you know it's the most beautiful experience that we can get from our travels on that very happy note, um, we open the floor to questions. If you have any questions, uh, we have a microphone at the back that we can bring to you, and please state your name and affiliation. Any questions from the room? Hi. Hi, I'm Jo. I'm part of the committee of the Hong Kong Eco Film Festival. But I want to know, what can we do locally for local tourism? You've mentioned getting on a plane is not a good idea, so maybe we do something here. What can we do, and who, if we see anything wrong, can we complain to? And sorry, that's an alley, <laughs> because you're local. Um, who can you complain to? <laughs> I think the government's a little backlogged right now, but um, yeah, I can point you to somewhere where you can write letters. There are, actually, that's a great question because actually because of the fact is, is that right now we have experienced a huge drop in tourism in Hong Kong. So a lot of local operators are hurting. Um, especially the independent ones. So there are some fantastic local food and cultural tour organizers. There are some, um, the one, there is one dolphin, um, so we recently wrote about this on Green Queen, one of the dolphin uh, operators, there are many, but there's one that's actually the only one that's accredited um, by all the cruelty-free um, organizations that actually doesn't damage the, the pink dolphin population and is actually a way to, to raise a funds towards them. And they're actually suffering greatly because of the drop in tourists and they actually were close to closing. So we are actually trying to encourage local uh, families on the weekends to go and support them. So again, I can send information about this, but I would say um, try to, again, practice uh, responsible um, tourist habits, but locally. So don't bring plastic. Uh, don't don't litter. There's still a lot of littering. I think in the country parks, they they removed a lot of the bins because they want to encourage people to take their rubbish with them. But it's ended up on some trails, making it just full of trash, um, which is a shame. Um, instead of doing kind of more traditional tourist activities, I always recommend people to do things like beach cleanup. So you're still getting outside and seeing Hong Kong's beautiful coastline, but embedded with a, a, a pro-environmental activity. Um, a lot of local NGOs run great programs to connect you to Hong Kong's outer islands and outer, outer areas, and they're usually environmentally and socially conscious. So I think that's the way to, to support. But, but do support the local mom and pop businesses on the weekends. Um, they, are, they are hurting, and uh, we are gonna see a lot of closures in the next few months. And, uh, you know, they rely on a lot of tourists that are, that are not coming. So that's a great question. To add anything? Um, well, again, it all comes back to civil participation. Like, choose, you know, vote for, you know, your rep local representatives who would, you know, lobby the government to, to make sensible policies on, you know, everything, including tourism and, incur like, encouraging um Staycation, like local tourism, uh, uh, local people um, going on uh, to the new territories on weekend and help these, uh, you know, wonderful tourism businesses instead of, you know, giving one hundred and twenty dollars for, for for citizens to, you know, go, you know, outside of Hong Kong. I don't really see how that could help the economy. Any other questions from the room? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is John Antweiler. I've lived here for a long time, and I'm a member of the... Is it on? Oh, okay, good. Um, 
uh, I'm a member of the FCC. I, I have sort of a comment, but also a, a question. And the comment is that um, I grew up in the western United States in a very rural part, and I used to complain to my parents about the tourists who would come in. And I said, you know, these people don't live here. They don't care. And my father said quite wisely, he said, you know, it is the tourists who are causing the conservation, causing the national parks, causing the wilderness areas, causing uh, these great moves in conservation. The local people just don't care. When I've gone to Indonesia, I've seen the same thing, that it is the tourist companies that are worried about the coastline, about the fish population, about all of these sorts of things. So my, my question is, yeah, tourists, we, we'd like to say you're creating a huge negative impact, but at the same time, you're creating a huge positive impact. And so I guess I ask you, where do you come down? Tourism a good thing, tourism a bad thing? About 20 years ago, a journalist called um, Ray Bonner wrote a book called The Hand of Man. And he was complaining about the camps coming into Africa uh, and um, not being reliable, um, you know, cleaning up their mess. Uh, but now, I met him just recently, and he said, well, I have to uh, recount on that because uh, the tourism in Africa is big business, and they're totally aware now of um, eco-tourism. So there's good and bad news. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I, I would say tourism is could be good um, if everybody travel mindfully. So tourism can be a huge force for good. Um, looking at like the 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 money that, that we bring into like uh, our travel destination and the kind of cultural exchange that we foster when you know when people travel around. So but then now I think the m mostly complaints come from irresponsible and inconsiderate travelers who don't who are simply not aware of the impact like negative impact on the on the locals and the environment so if we continue to educate more people to travel more sustainably and and ethically and mindfully uh, I do believe that tourism is uh, is a huge force for good in this world all right I hope that answered your question sir um, any other questions? We have time for one more. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is TC Yi. Uh, I'm uh, one of the uh, FCC member. Uh, well, uh, in Hong Kong here, we see uh, well increasing uh, promotions or advertisements for long haul travels, uh, like uh, uh, well, wildlife uh, uh, migration in Africa. And then even down to the South Pole to Antarctica, I, I guess these are all uh, quite damaging. Yes. And uh, in fact, uh, unfortunately, most travel agency would promote or try to tempt the uh, tourists to to take up business class because such a long travel, right? Eh? Um, <laughs> well, the, because the margin of uh, increase is probably not so significant comparing to, well, uh, I mean, a regular destination or, or shorter distance travels. How, how do you see uh, these trends in the next 10 years? Do you would like to start? Um, I, yeah, I speak to a lot of um, activists and NGOs, and uh, one of the most damaging uh, travel practices around the world is cru cruise ships. Mm -hmm. um, so you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, there's going to be more and more demand for cruise travel and these kind of large-scale going to previously untouched uh, zones like the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I, I personally don't think that's a big positive other than researchers and scientists who need to go there for, um, for, to gather data and to, to, to kind of see how those, those environments are progressing. I think those are um, ego travel. It's, that's what I, I think that is. It's a way to just be able to go on Instagram and say, I'm amazing, I have lots of money, and I went to Antarctica. There's actually not much to do in Antarctica. It's just you on a ship uh, looking at ice. 
So it's not even <laughs> that it's transformative and that there's huge Absolutely. amounts of wildlife. It's, 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 it's ego travel. And uh, I think we need to go back to what you, Vincy said, so civil part of, civic participation, so voting on November 24th, try and vote for people who care about the environment Absolutely. locally. Um, and obviously vote again with your dollar not to do that and try and uh, educate people around you by sharing resources. Um, most people who are in the sustainability industry would agree that those types of trends are, are, are really worrying and damaging. Um, and we need to kind of lessen their growth. Absolutely. Would you agree, Vincy? Totally. Yeah. And would you agree, it. John? Um, I, I saw eco, ego travel in March this year. Um, I was uh, with my guide and a hunt was just about to happen with a, a lion chasing a zebra and a jeep came up beside us and there were two very, very glamorous American women with perfect teeth in their best barbecue outfit and they were both on their iPhones. And there was magic happening in front of them and they stayed on their iPhones and I felt like throwing a rock at them. <laughs> Well said, man. That's, that's so true. Would you like to add anything? No, Throw I some think, rocks? Yeah. Or? Well, pretty much my, uh, yeah, Janet's my lead. All right. Um, well, that concludes our talk for today. And if you'd like more information on all the resources that our panelists have talked about, we will be posting an article on the FCC website. Please stay tuned. And of course, um, don't forget the books at the back. Um, Jan Lata has actually spent months and months um, piecing those books, each book together, and she's just finished she just her spent 17th. She 25 years. Yes, yeah, she spent 25 <laughs> years piecing together this book, so please do have a look. And thank you again for coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.